of course, the biggest, you know, issue this season on any single player was the performance of Jordan Poole, um, which is not said uh, to malign Jordan. It is not said said in any kind of mean spirited way. Uh, obviously, Jordan Poole had a bad season for most of the season, and Jordan Poole very much knows that which is why he kept working and why he was able to in the final uh, half of the season perform much better. And the final month is like a 23 points, eight assists kind of guy. And you're going, wow, okay, Jordan Poole is not dead. The Jordan Poole that we saw helped Golden State win a championship is still in there somewhere. Look at this guy go. And so I asked, you know, uh, these guys today about Poole and about the turnaround and what went wrong, the slump he was in and, and how ultimately he was able to, to pull himself out of it, and this is a bit of a long answer, but uh, I thought it was really telling, and and you might be able to hear this, but I could certainly see it being in the room. Michael Winger actually got emotional in talking about how Jordan Poole turned his season around. Jordan is... He's an incredibly introspective and kind person. I don't know if you've had a lot of time to spend with him, but um, the Jordan that sort of generally gets written about and the Jordan that exists behind uh, a pair of spectacles are two two different people um, he loves talking hoop he loves it um, and he's a really smart a really smart kid and so like he knew what he was going through early in the season and he just kept telling us like I'm gonna put in the work I'm gonna do the work I'm gonna do the work the work will pay off the work will pay off and, you know, he, he was taking darts and bullets and everything else throughout the course of the season. He just ignored it. He ignored it better than I did, quite frankly. Um, um, he just kept saying, like, I'm going to work. I'm going to work, and the work will pay off. And um, to your point, I mean, I'll be damned, but, it, it, I mean, he had a slump, a long slump, and it was hard for him. It was hard for us to watch, um, not as objective observers, but as people who can just, like, reach in and, like, fix a problem for him. Um but he came through because he's a worker, he's a gamer, he's a hooper, super high character basketball player. And it's just, you know, sometimes guys will surprise you by the amount of work they put in and how it pays off. And he did that. It was moving to watch him sort of come out of what he went through early in the season. My experiences with Jordan, they were always be where your feet are. And he was really good at that. He understood that this was a phase, it was going to pass. And what was going to get him through was his consistency and his work ethic. And like Mike said, he, he ignored the noise better than most. But I don't think what people understand is what got to him was the losing and not being competitive. It wasn't the stuff that people were saying about him because he always worried about the end result in terms of team. How can we be better, not just me? And he had a deep passion for that. He reached out to his teammates. We would have a lot of text exchange, a lot of talks on the plane after, after games. And I just knew that he'd break through on that stuff. Did he have the season that he wanted from beginning to end? No. But did he finish the season on a way to give him more confidence to go into the summer and be the player we know he can be? Yeah. And again, that's how I kind of look at the season, not in just small little increments, but you break it down and then you see where you're at at the end. I, I think that the, like the, the caricature, that's the word I'm looking for, the caricature of Jordan Poole versus the reality of Jordan Poole are just two different things. Um, and Jordan Poole sometimes, and the, the problem is, sometimes Jordan Poole does play like a bit of a knucklehead basketball player. And in D.C. specifically, that has traditionally been matched with a bit of a knucklehead of a person. Um, like Nick Young was a knucklehead, uh, to, to borrow from the Mike Wilbon school of, of vocabulary here. Right, like Nick Young took crazy shots, and Nick Young also off the court did crazy stuff. And Jordan Poole, you know, likes fashion, and so sometimes people are like, "Whoa, Jordan Poole's a little out there" because he wears something that's a little bit uh, flashy or different, or, or or you know, whatever, um, whatever word you want to use for uh, what most fashion people will call really good fashion. Um, but you got you got that element of bad defense, crazy shots passes that that go to nowhere and people just think he's kind of a, a doofus and it's just not anything I've ever heard from talking to people in Golden State to talking to people around the Wizards and it is to a person like no this kid like loves basketball and he works harder than anyone and so to hear those guys talk about that 
I thought was really encouraging. And uh, to hear that Jordan blocked out the noise and was locked in in a way that nobody from the outside could imagine and frankly was better than a guy like Winger, who I think really had a tough time. Uh, he, He talked about this today. Had a tough time at times, like canceling out the noise, whether it was about the team, whether it was about individual players, whether it was about whatever. The fact that Jordan at 24 years old was at the the center of it, as the guy who has to go perform every night, was just like, I'm just going to keep working. Like, talk about competitiveness. That's tremendous. And ultimately, it pays off in the end. But there was something structural that changed. There was undoubtedly something that was different about the Wizards post-All-Star break when it comes to Jordan Poole that seemed to be ignored in those answers. I followed up on it. And uh, I flummoxed Winger a little bit because I don't think he he knows he doesn't have the answer yet. But you got to hear his answer uh, when it comes to the Wizards' future and what it how much it could involve Jordan Poole. You'll hear that next, and we'll take your calls. The Wizards' season is over. You've now heard from players on Monday. You heard from interim coach Brian Keefe. You've heard from Winger. You've heard from Dawkins. What do you make of year one, or even let's call it year zero, of the Wizards' rebuild? 301-230-0980 plus Winger on the future of Jordan Poole next on the Hoffman Show. Let's talk to Michael Winger and, and Will Dawkins about uh, the Wizards season and, and talked about Jordan Poole and they, they had all these things, nice things to say about Jordan when it comes to his work ethic and how he turned it around. And I just kind of felt like there was an elephant in the room, which is that there was a big change with beyond his work ethic and beyond all those things that are undoubtedly true that changed uh, Jordan Poole's season and, and turned it around And by the way, that also has a big effect on decisions they make, not just for Jordan, but on Tyus Jones in the future. The one change that did seem to be made structurally for him was putting the ball in his hands. Obviously, first the move to the bench, and then ultimately when Tyus goes out, putting the ball in his hands as the starting point guard. Um, One, what conversations were that? Just like Brian making the decision versus you all doing that collaboratively. And then two, Tyus is an unrestricted free agent. You guys, when not trading him, and also in the comments have said, we want him back. How do you square that of of how that all could potentially work together moving forward? That nervous laugh from Michael Winger, I wish we could show you the look on his face because what I seem to have hit was, as they call it, a nerve. <laughs> You're hitting upon what will be a very complex conversation for us. Um, Jordan does like having the ball in his hands and he's really good with the ball in his hands. Tyus likes having the ball in his hands and is also very good with the ball in his hands. Um, these are, I mean, it is our job, along with a head coach and a coaching staff, to figure out how to make that work. Both are really good basketball players and really good people. An organization like like ours, or frankly any organization, but for where we are right now, we can't have too many of those kind of guys. Um, you know, Tyus, to your point, he is an unrestricted free agent, and there are 29 other, 29 other teams that know he's a good player and a good dude, and he's going to have a lot of options. He deserves to have those options. He deserves to have those conversations. Um, he did express to us an interest in coming back, and we expressed to him an interest in coming back, uh, bringing it back. We'll have those conversations in July, um, but I, I, I truly have no answers for you right now as to how how we make um, you know all of Jordan's best and all of Tyus's best coexist. Uh, once we have a coaching staff in place, that'll be one of the very first things that we roll up our sleeves and try to figure out. I thought that was a refreshingly honest and interesting answer from Michael Winger, which is basically, yeah, man, we got to figure that out. We don't have a clue. And what I think is also uh, present in that answer is a conundrum that ultimately the Wizards are going to have to figure out, which is they want to be, and they are, a people-first organization, which now makes them, uh, that is how the commanders are run as well. They've talked about that a lot, that it is people-first but ultimately, when you win, like the people first has to become a prerequisite. And then you need more than just, hey, this is a good dude and a good player. You need, like, this is a good dude who fits with our basketball team and how we want to play basketball. And this is the conundrum for the Wizards is they have 
two guys with very different skill sets, but the very same needs. They need to play with the ball in their hands. They need to be surrounded by bigger people to help them on the defensive end. And they are good people who work hard and can be have some leadership qualities. I think Tyus's are obviously much more well-developed. Tyus is also much older than Jordan, which seems like a relevant plot point here. Um, so you, you can't, you just like from a basketball standpoint, you cannot possibly move forward with the both of them. And I just, I, I, at that point wonder if we look back in July, once they've had those conversations and Michael Winger is willing to admit, even if not on the record, that they might've made a mistake in not trading Tyus Jones at the trade deadline. And that they ultimately let him walk for nothing, or can they get something in a sign and trade? I do think that is certainly a possibility. And, and, you know, Tyus, I think wants to do right by the wizards. Cause I think Tyus really enjoyed his time here. I think Tyus wants to be, I mean, Tyus straight up said, like, I want to explore staying here. And he knows that they're not going to be good anytime soon. He knows that he could go somewhere tomorrow and compete for a championship. And that speaks incredibly loudly about the environmental piece that they talked about that we played for you earlier. That one of the things Will Dawkins highlighted that we didn't actually play for you was that the environmental improvements they made to this organization where guys enjoyed showing up to work but also that their families were taken care of and some of those types of things the fact that Tyus Jones is like I know uh, Tyus is not stupid he knows that he could go sign with uh, the Lakers the Nuggets uh the the Warriors the um, well, I guess maybe not the Warriors because they're, you know, who knows what their future is. But certainly, like, a team like the Nuggets, a team like the Celtics, and, like, be the backup point guard on a championship team and be competing for rings tomorrow. He could go back to Minnesota, who were dra- who drafted him, where he's from, and that he that tried to trade for him at the deadline but ultimately wouldn't give up a first for him. And so, uh, Will said no. Like, he could go there and he could play with Anthony Edwards and be competing for championships next year. And he's like, I'm going to keep the Wizards on the list. That speaks very well to what Washington is doing. But it does get down to the nitty gritty of the point, which is ultimately, when do you stop worrying about we have enough good people and not that you want bad people, but that good people who come to work every day with the right attitude is not enough that they actually have to be able to play good basketball together. And I think that is ultimately what Michael Winger, as the lead architect of this, and Will Dawkins as his side-by-side lieutenant, are going to struggle with over the next couple of months, specifically when it comes to Poole and Jones. They don't want to give up either of them. Poole is the obvious one to hang on to because he's younger, has a higher upside, and he's also contractually here versus Tyus, who's not. Uh, and, and you can just let walk and, and take the cap space or whatever. But that that is the existential question. And what they might decide is that time to make that that cut is not now. That just re-sign Tyus, they'll figure it out, they'll play Jordan off the bench, they'll play Ty. Maybe Tyus is like off the bench and they're like, hey dude, this is what you're gonna be on a championship team, probably, or you know, if there's injuries, whatever. Like we'll figure it out. But we're going to trade you probably at the trade deadline, but we're going to give you another, you like being here, we're going to give you another six months to a year. And whether you trade him at the deadline or you trade him next summer, you just figure it out then because right now, having him around as a leader and having him around as a guy who you can trust is more important than the fit from a basketball perspective at this stage of the rebuild. That is ultimately what they have to decide. The new coaching staff will have an input on that, but it is... uh it was refreshing again to use that word in a way to see Michael Winger uh, just kind of go like, yeah, dude, you hit the nail on the head and I don't have a good answer for you because I don't know that there necessarily is one with where they are right now, which maybe that's a criticism in its own right or maybe it's just kind of the facts of where they are and what you care about when you're this early in a rebuilding process with the lofty type of goals of consistent competitiveness that they ultimately have. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.